So Father, we just thank you today for your presence in our midst. We thank you for opportunities to grow and to learn and to give. We thank you for the reminder that prayer is so essential in all that we do and all that you're doing in our lives. And so this morning, Lord, we just lift up some to you in prayer who have different needs that you know best and how to meet them. Lord, so we lift up Ruth to you today. Uh, we lift up Andy Holman's father and Eileen's mother. Lord, we lift up Sam to you today and Sharon. We lift up Eileen and Sue, John and Donna. We pray for Marge and Ray, Michelle and Kathy, for Mom Bell, for Sino, for Mary and Holly, Maddie and little Lorelai, for Kevin, for Judy. Lord, we lift up Danny and Gretchen. We thank you for uh, Harold and Inez and the work you're doing in their lives. We pray for Linda and Bethany. We pray for Colette and Brittany. Lord, we pray in accordance to the leading of our prophetic team that seeks you and, and, and gives us direction for our prayer and, and their sense that we would learn to go to you for all that we need. Not to look elsewhere, not to look to the left or to the right, but to look to you at all times for all things because you have all the answers. We thank you that your answers are in your word. As we press into your word today, we ask you to give us the answers that we need for what we're facing today and in the days ahead. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you know, it's somewhat typical for me to open up a sermon with a joke, as bad as they may be sometimes. But I will tell you that as I looked at this section of scripture, I just couldn't, there was nothing in me that could fathom that I would start off this message with a joke because today we're gonna to look at that portion of the Gospel of Matthew in Matthew 27, which has the most intense, serious, and significant story in the entire Bible, which is the passion and the crucifixion of Jesus. And so we're just gonna start right in here with the video as we start in at verse 27 of chapter 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews! They said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. This um, scarlet robe, uh, Matthew describes as a scarlet robe that they put on Jesus, may have well just simply been one of those cloaks that the soldiers all wore. I don't know if they had access to something fancy. They just maybe threw one on him to make him look more king-like. And then, of course, they made this uh, woven crown of thorns out of probably some bush that was nearby. Uh, and certainly the thorns dug into his head and then they hit him over the head with a stick to drive it in further. But everything they're doing here is kind of a mockery of the fact that the charges that the Jewish leaders have brought against Jesus is that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. So they're mocking him saying, oh yeah, you're the king of the Jews, that's wonderful. We bow down before you. But what they're really doing is saying, our power is greater than your power, king. But what's crazy is that Jesus is the king. <laughs> he's not just the king of the Jews, he's the king of kings, he's the Lord of lords, he's the king of the universe. And his kingdom will far outlast the kingdom of Rome, Amen. which will come collapsing down in, in the generations ahead, but they don't realize this. They really believe that they have more power than Jesus. And it's similar to what we saw back in chapter 26 when the Jewish leaders were mocking Jesus as a prophet. They said in verses 67 and 68, then they spat in his face and beat him with their fist and slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is the one who hits you? And once again, they don't understand that Jesus is the greatest prophet who ever lived. 
The spirit of Christ is a spirit of prophecy. He is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, but they don't understand that. And so even today, many people in our world have ideas about Jesus, but they don't know who he really is. They might say, oh yeah, he was a great man, or he was a great teacher, um, but they won't believe, as we sang this morning, I believe he was a sacrificial lamb. They don't believe that. They don't believe he was the son of God. They don't believe he is the king or the Lord of their lives. That's the same with these people back then. So now the soldiers have had their fun and games with Jesus, getting a few laughs in his behalf, and they're going to lead him away to Calvary, the hill, to be crucified. But at this point, because of what they've now put him through, and the beating and the scourging, he is so weak that he can't cr carry the cross by himself. And so we see this starting in verse 32. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. That piece there is incredibly significant. And you may have read it before and not thought much of it, but there's, there's a real power in that last little piece there because gall was a combination of bitter herbs, uh, one of which was myrrh. And it, first of all, gave a horrible taste to the wine, made it taste like vinegar. But there was another reason why this was significant, because myrrh and wine mixed together were considered to be a painkiller. And so these soldiers, as brutal as they are, they actually have an element of mercy in them because they're going to have to watch Jesus and the others suffer on the cross. My guess is they offered this drink to all of them because it was like, look, you're going to hang here. You got these nails in you. And how about if we just give you something to drink and you'll kind of be numb and drugged out and maybe you won't feel it so bad. Maybe it'll be over sooner. But Jesus tastes it and refuses to drink it. First of all, there's a fulfillment of prophecy here. Psalm 69 verse 21 says, they also gave me gall for my food and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. If you read what Jesus went through and you understand what the process of, of dehydration that comes on when somebody's been whipped or beaten and they've lost blood, the body's trying to replenish those fluids, those liquids, and he must have been incredibly thirsty. But... Once he tastes, it says he tastes that uh, wine mixed with gall and, and the myrrh, he refuses to drink it. And there's a very specific reason why he refuses to drink it. He must experience that pain. He has to. Remember when we talked about Pontius Pilate doing this unusual thing for Jesus where he had him scourged and crucified, whereas most people were either scourged or crucified. Crucifixion was the ultimate penalty. Why would you need to scourge him? Because Jesus had to suffer. Jesus needed to be scourged and crucified because he was paying a price. He was taking a punishment on himself that we deserved for our sins. In doing so, the pain, the physical pain that he was about to experience was part of the price. If Jesus had sipped or drank some of that painkiller, there would have been a chance that the price he was supposed to pay for your sin or my sin wouldn't have gotten paid. That you or I would have stood before God one day and said, but Jesus died for me. And God would have said, well, he, your pain didn't count because he drank the painkiller. Your, your debt wasn't paid. But that didn't happen. Because Jesus chose to suffer every single drop of pain 
unimaginable pain that this experience was going to put him through because he wanted to make sure to cover every single sin that you or I or anyone else has ever committed by taking that pain on that cross. Then we see other things were going on while he was hanging there. Let's pick this up in verse 35. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. There's three little things in that section, those two verses. One is the casting lots, one is the sign over his head. But the first part, it goes over so quickly, you can almost miss it. It says, and when they had crucified him. But that's the essence of everything. So I want to read to you, not to be gory, just to be realistic. This is a description from a commentary of what Jesus went through. Crucifixion was a slow and agonizing death. Nails were probably driven through the wrists rather than the palms. One, because the wrist was a stronger bone. Two, to increase the pain. The weight of the suspended body made breathing difficult and painful. Involuntary efforts by the legs to ease the pressure greatly increased pain in the feet. And this ordeal continued until the exhausted victim could no longer breathe. This might take several days. In Jesus' case, it only took three hours. But when people died from crucifixion, they basically suffocated to death. When the soldiers were dividing his garments, it was a fulfillment of Psalm 28, verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. John gives a little bit of extra detail in John 19. He says, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece, so they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Apparently, from what we know, if you were a Roman soldier and you were assigned to crucifixion duty, you got paid your normal paycheck, and you got to keep whatever you could take from the people being crucified. Obviously, they weren't going to need it anymore. And apparently from what John's saying here, there might have been four soldiers on the detail of Jesus and he had different things. He had a robe and he had, uh, you know, you have, you've seen the play, right? Had the sash, the type of thing going on there. So they each took a part, but then all of a sudden it was his tunic and it was hand woven and it was seamless and they decided rather than tear it up to split it, we'll just throw dice and see who gets it. And of course that was a fulfillment of a scripture prophesied a long time ago by King David. Then we see, uh, again, something more from John 19 about the sign that Pilate hung over Jesus' head. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Because he was the king of the Jews. And so we see that is all going on, and there's this additional uh, drama that Jesus has to experience now. We'll start in verse 38. Two robbers were crucified with him. One on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You, 
We're going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross. If you are the son of God. <laughs> the same way the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others. They said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. <laughs> In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Now, it's an interesting thing because we always think of thieves or robbers uh, as if they stole something. But this actual word that's used here for the guys that were crucified on his left and right is a word that was more commonly used for rebels, for people who were in rebellion against Rome. Uh, that's more likely the case because for stealing, you might get scourged or you might get thrown in jail but for rebellion you would get crucified the other reason why it's likely these guys were rebels even if they were robbers is what math uh, mark 15 7 says it says the man named barabbas had been imprisoned with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the insurrection so in all likelihood if you can imagine this barabbas gets arrested along with other guys. We know that from this, right? This crucifixion that was scheduled for this day, in all likelihood, was going to be these two guys and Barabbas, except for the fact that Barabbas has been released in Jesus' place. So these two were most likely Barabbas' partners in the insurrection. They were rebels. They had committed a murder, possibly killed a Roman soldier in this rebellion. Barabbas got off those two were still in prison, had to go to the cross with Jesus. Luke simply refers to them as criminals. And he tells us this story, which you're familiar with, I think, in Luke 23. One of the criminals who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? Yet indeed, we are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to them, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. The people mock Jesus for all kinds of things here. They mock him for claiming to be able to raise the temple back up in three days. But what they don't understand is that's exactly what he's going to do. Because when he said, I'll raise the temple in three days if you destroy it, he was talking about the temple of his body. He was saying, you destroy me, that's okay. In three days, I'll be back. They also say, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. This is really important. Twice in these passages, they've made reference in a mocking way to the fact that he said he was the Son of God. Why is that important? Because we live in a culture, once again, where people like to pigeonhole Jesus and say he was this, but he wasn't this. And they will oftentimes say this ridiculous statement, but Jesus never said he was the Son of God. Yes, he did, multiple times. And that's why they're throwing it back in his face while he's hanging on the cross. If he didn't say he was the son of God, why are the people ridiculing him saying, well, if you're the son of God, come down? They're saying that because he said it. And he said it because it was true. And the fact of the matter is, because he's the son of God, they're saying, if you are, then come down from there. It's the reason he's not coming down from there. He told Peter and the others in the garden, if I wanted to, I could call on my father right now. He would send more than 10,000 angels. I don't have to be arrested. I don't have to be beaten. I don't have to be crucified. I choose to do this. And so as the Son of God, he had chosen 
to say, yes, I could ask to be taken down, but I already did this with my father. In the garden, I said, is there some other way than this? He said, no. I said, well, then not my will, it's your will be done. And your will is for me to hang here until my last breath. Your will is for me to suffer every bit of pain that this requires so that all sin can be forgiven for eternity. Amen. Then we see as, as the end comes near, uh, darkness falls. We see this starting in verse 45. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. <laughs> About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those standing there heard this. They said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. But the rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice. He gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. So there was a a darkness. The Bible tells us that came over the whole area. It says from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. Now that's how the Jews measured time. But if we were to put it in modern time, it was basically from noon to 3 p.m this darkness that was hanging over the the world at that time. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now this is two things. One, he's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. Psalm 22 is is a prophetic psalm about Jesus hanging on the cross, if you read the whole thing. And, And in Jewish culture, if you quoted the first verse of a psalm, you were in essence quoting the whole psalm. So he's yelling that out because it's a fulfillment of scripture, but it's also a measure of the deep distress that he was suffering at that time, not just the physical. The physical's bad enough, but he's about to feel the result of separation from his father. His father could not have any contact with sin. Jesus was about to become sin. In in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says he... That means God the Father made him who knew no sin, that means Jesus, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus is now representing all of our sin so that the punishment that he's taking can pay for that sin. He is standing in our place as if he committed the sins we've committed and saying, I'll take the punishment for those sins. And when you think about this moment and the agonizing experience that Jesus is having, realize this, that he and his father up till this moment have never been separate. 
Not for a second, not for a moment since the beginning of eternity have they been apart, and now they are. And in fact, they would never be separated again, but now they are. And in essence, what, that's part of the punishment that Jesus paid for us, because sin has separated us from God. And Jesus said, I don't want you to be separate from my Father, I'll be separate from my Father for you. Your sin will separate me from my Father, therefore your sin will not have to separate you from my Father. In verse 48, it says somebody gives Jesus some sour wine. This is not mixed with gall, apparently, and they offer it to Jesus. It doesn't say whether he drank it, but he could have at that point, as thirsty as he was. <coughs> Two verses later, uh, Matthew simply says he cried out one last time. In Luke 23, 46, it says his final cry was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then in verses 51 to 53, some pretty powerful things start to happen on the earth now that Jesus has died. First of all, the curtain that was in the temple was torn right down the middle. This curtain was also called the veil of the temple. It separated two places. One was the uh, holy place and the other was called the holy of holies. The holy place a lot of different priests could go into the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could go into, and he could only go in once a year on the Day of Atonement. It's described to us this way in Hebrews chapter 9. Now, even the first covenant, the Old Testament, had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which there was the lampstand, the table, and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold in which there was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded and the tables of the covenant. In other words, the Ten Commandments were in there. And above it were cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat but these things we cannot speak now in detail. So this was covered with these two golden angels facing each other. Now Paul goes on, he says this. Now when these things have been prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle performing the divine worship. But into the second, into the Holy of Holies, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. The whole old covenant, the whole old way of trying to reach God is gone now because Jesus has replaced it. That was the significance of that veil being torn. That veil kept everybody out of God's presence, but no more. We can go into God's presence. Here's what Hebrews 19 says. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that curtain, which is his flesh. So Jesus, by offering himself, God signified the separation between you and God, the separation between me and God doesn't exist anymore. And it's interesting because somebody pointed this out. How was the veil torn? From top to bottom. Nobody grabbed it at the bottom and started tearing. God grabbed it at the top and started tearing. Amen. And there is nothing to separate us anymore from, from God's presence. And that's why it's, it's sad that we don't go to God more, that we don't spend time in his presence, that we don't pray, that we don't worship to the extent that we can. Because Jesus paid a terrible price to give us that opportunity to do so. And sometimes we take it like, yeah, whatever. Maybe next week I'll do that. The game's on right now. Here's the crazy thing. Roman historians, historians documented a solar eclipse during that period of time. Co coincided with that three hours of darkness. Roman historians back in that day. Modern day geologists, I don't know how they do this stuff. 
But they have machines that can trace back every earthquake in history. And they've been able to trace back an earthquake that happened on Friday, April 3rd, 33 AD. Boom. Now, I think what's really crazy is verses 52 and 53. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. We've got this fixation in our culture with zombies. You know what I mean? The Walking Dead and all these other shows. These guys were not zombies because the zombies are dead bodies. They're not really alive. These guys were alive again. The reason why they were alive again was because they were fulfilling, at least partially, the prophecy from Daniel 12 too. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. Those to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. These were saints. It says holy people were raised up. And we don't know a whole lot more than it happened, and it probably freaked a lot of people out. <laughs> One of the commentaries says this. There's no way of knowing who these people were. We'll ask in heaven, hey, God, who were they? Like, and we'll go get to ask them, like, what was that like when you walked up to people? You know? and, the, and the commentary says this. We don't even know whether they died again, right? Or whether God just took them after he'd raised them. Because the way to heaven was now open. We know this. They made a very brief appearance, but their resurrection was proof that Jesus had broken the power of death. And the combination of all this going on, the earthquake, the eclipse, the veil being torn, dead people walking out of graves, causes at least one Roman soldier, maybe more, to say, I think this was the Son of God. <laughs> we might have just made a big mistake. And so he comes to an understanding that the leaders of Israel refused to accept that God's son had come to the earth not to rule and reign the way they expected him to, but to come and sacrifice himself and to die in our place so that we could have eternal life. And that little scene in those verses of those dead Old Testament saints coming out of the graves is simply a preview of what is awaiting us. Ain't no grave going to hold this body down. <laughs> Romans 8, 11 says this. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. Amen. You know, when we take the communion and we look at uh, Paul's instructions in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we see that Jesus said, do this and remember me. Remember me. You know, we think at Easter time of what Jesus went through. This morning as we go through chapter 27 Matthew, we think of what Jesus went through. I think we should remember all the time what Jesus went through. Because I don't know about you. I just know for me. And I'm not any different than you. So I think it might be true for you too. I have choices to make in my life of, of how I act and how I speak and how my attitude is. And when I think of what Jesus has done for me, it changes the choices I make. I, I tend to think a little, not always, but a little less selfishly when I realize what he went through so that I could be a different person. And I want to be that person. This song is called We Remember You. All of us have gone astray Turning back to our own way Then love arrived To give us life that day Our sorrow and our griefs he bore Guilt and shame forever worn Silent he, he died for me that day. 
we remember we remember you your body that was broken and your flesh torn through we remember we remember you and your blood that covers all forsaken by the hearts of men abandoned by his closest friends yet unimpaired he saw me there that day we remember we remember you your body that was broken and your flesh torn through we remember we remember you and your blood that covers all it covers all the lamb of god was spotless suffering regardless he gave it all yet though ourselves esteemed him stricken and rejected we have been redeemed and we remember we remember you your body that was broken and your flesh torn through we remember we remember you and your blood that covers all father we we remember jesus today in the sacrifice that we saw represented in our communion this morning and what we saw demonstrated in your word this morning we remember what an incredible sacrifice he made the, the simple phrase dying on a cross for my sins doesn't really sum up the brutality the agony the separation from you the pain the refusal to take the painkiller but say no I need to I need to feel this all all of it because I want all of my people to be forgiven and to know that they're forgiven well, father we just ask that you would keep us mindful of that that Jesus gave it all for us shed every drop of blood endured every pain that was necessary to give us complete access to you and access to a new life to become the people you created us to be with no more separation caused by sin we ask you to help us to remember Jesus and what he did not just on communion Sundays but in how we live our lives and we thank you for this today in his most precious name amen, amen. And the altar is open this morning and please remember the kids at the rescue mission if you can before you leave <laughs>